Pumping iron became an undeniable defining landmark in the culture of bodybuilding, and it greatly influenced the public's perception of fitness in general. Before the release of the film, surveys of sports fans showed that bodybuilding ranked a dismal 35th, just behind tractor pulling, in terms of its national popularity as a sport. While the title Pumping Iron is a phrase that's become synonymous for the activity of working out and lifting weights, you might question where the expression even came from. Before it became the title of Charles Gaines and George Butler's iconic book and film, it was derived from Gaines' own formative gym experiences when he was a teenager, training with a friend in the deep south of Alabama. Yeah, so the term Pumping Iron that came from uh, from Alabama, right? When you were, there was, wasn't there someone there that he used to pronounce it pump and iron. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. Right. My great friend John, John Gunn and I used to, uh, we were both 16 and we were both playing football and we were both sort of on the thin side. And we needed to beef up. So we had a friend named Fred Crabb who had some weights down in his basement. And Gunn used to say, Gaines, let's go pump iron. <laughs> A-R-N was that's the, so. Arnold would later claim that his bricklaying business started with Franco Colombo was called pumping bricks, but Gaines says this was highly unlikely since the phrase hadn't evolved into common usage at the time. Although Butler and Gaines always claimed that pumping iron was primarily about bodybuilding first and foremost, and not about Arnold, it's impossible to ignore the foreign translations of the film which basically highlight that the film is indeed all about Arnold. Translated titles from other languages include The Man with the Muscles of Steel from Brazil, The Man of Steel from Italy, Arnold the Magnificent from France, The Ironclad Arnold Schwarzenegger from Japan. Okay, and this next one has me stumped, so if we have any Danish speakers who could clarify, the situation is beefsteak? When promoting the movie, Arnold's magnetism obviously eclipsed everyone else's efforts in the film, resulting in people confusing Ed Corney for Arnold, despite Ed's image also appearing on 5,000 promotional posters across New York. Ed was often greeted with the comments saying how much he looked like Arnold. Arnold jokingly conceded that he was glad it was Ed on the posters and not him, as, quote unquote, you should see what they do to those posters on the subway, Ed. As mentioned in a previous video, securing financing for the book and the film were practically a mission impossible for Butler and Gaines. The New York Times initially dismissed the book project as fag bait, and Sandy Richardson at Doubleday Publishing demanded his advance money back, saying that no one would be interested in a project about the shady world of bodybuilding or Arnold Schwarzenegger. Despite the book going on to be a huge success selling 700,000 copies, and making it the best-selling book by a single photographer in history at the time, it was an even more challenging task raising the funds to begin and complete the film. Shooting for Pumping Iron wrapped up in 1975, but it took a further two years to raise the additional financing to bring it to the big screen. Butler was so broke that he couldn't even afford to send the camera equipment back from South Africa to New York once shooting had wrapped on location. To add to the frustration, the distributor sold Pumping Iron to PBS for $30,000, whereas a week later, ABC offered to buy the film for $1 million, but by then, it was too late. And again, it bears mentioning the equally strange snubbing of the film by Joe Weider and the IFBB, both in regards to the promotion, recognition, or even financing of the film. Pumping Iron not only put bodybuilding on the map, but it simultaneously pulled Joe Weider into its jet stream, assisting Joe to wrest control of the sport from his longtime adversary, Bob Hoffman. Had the makers of Pumping Iron chosen to feature Hoffman's AAU and the then more publicly respected Mr. America contest, bodybuilding might have traversed in a completely different direction. The film went on to be nominated for an Academy Award in 1978 for the best documentary feature, but it lost to another indie production titled The Man Who Skied Down Everest. Gaines recruited the services of famed publicist and marketing genius Bobby Zaram, who was pivotal in aligning Arnold with the cultural glitterati at the time. 
Biographer Lawrence Lerner asserts that Arnold's broader stardom began not with fans shouting his name in the street, but with celebrities adjusting their schedule to meet him. Gaines also dug deep into his own Rolodex of connections, which included future presidential candidate John Kerry, who played an instrumental role in organising fundraising efforts for the film. The Kennedy family were likewise pivotal in giving the film that vital, credible cultural cachet among the respectable elites. When asked which celebrity he most wanted to meet by the film's publicist, Arnold replied, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, who was wife of the assassinated President John Kennedy. Photographed over lunch with Jackie Kennedy by the newspaper media, catapulted Arnold into the spotlight of public consciousness. Jackie even took her son to watch the film. Kennedy's nephew, Bobby Shriver, was a big fan of the movie and in turn took his sister Maria to a screening and then later introduced her to Arnold and, well, we all know where that went. I saw it in 1977, right when it came out. My brother uh, took me to it. I met Arnold like two months later. So I have a special little spot in my heart for this film. As mentioned in the previous video, beyond a few blink and you'll miss them moments, good friend, competitive rival and sometimes training partner of Arnold's Frank Sane was noticeably absent from the film. This was at a time when Frank was a fixture among the Gold's gym scene in Venice and approaching his physical prime. Frank, who was articulate, good-looking and charismatic, already had a lot of footage shot for the film, including a scene in which he donned a lab coat explaining nutrition. Remembering that at that time Arnold was considered a freak by normal standards, Frank was arguably the more marketable option to the general public due to his classic proportions, academic pedigree, and general intellectual demeanour which defied the bodybuilder stereotypes. Unfortunately for Frank, Arnold's intangible charisma and magnetic screen presence trumped everybody and everything. Seeing the chaotic circus that Golds had transformed into during the filming, Zane decamped to Vince Gironda's no-nonsense gym, despite its inconvenient distance away. While Frank enjoyed the low-key atmosphere at Vince's, he admitted the minimal leg equipment, Vince even disallowed squats in his gym, compromised the quality of his leg development that year, and he placed fourth behind Albert Beckles. Frank later assisted in the promotion and fundraising efforts of the film, posing at the Whitney Museum of Art's display of muscle along with Arnold and Ed Corney, not only exposed New York's stuffy elite to the sport of bodybuilding, it also doubled as a fundraiser to complete that final leg of production. Butler had expected an audience of around 250 people in an event that ran the risk of being a disastrous farce. Defying expectations and packing the venue to capacity with over 3,000 people and many more outside demanding entry, the museum staff had to throw the admission money on the floor from the enthusiastic hordes, clamouring to get a glimpse of their hero Arnold. While some of the panel critiqued the questionable negative health effects of bodybuilding, Another complained about bodybuilding's discrimination against females. Frank Zane's comparison of his body with sculpture was ridiculed by an art academic who replied, If you are a work of art, you had a bad teacher, because to me, your poses are the personification of 19th century camp, and not at all beautiful. Frank cleverly fired back that the critic was projecting his own feelings of inadequacy onto him saying that he saw himself as more of an athlete than an interpretive art piece. Arnold, on the other hand, was more endearing in his remarks before the audience. I actually feel that I'm in heaven being here tonight, he said. It is the greatest night of my life. The next day, however, he was a little more qualified and ambivalent in his praise, laughingly recounting to friends, In a personal sense, it was terrific, but in every other way, it was a total disaster. Candice Bergen on assignment for the Today Show later laughed with Butler saying that Arnold had had his 15 minutes of fame. The evening produced enough cash to finish the edit, and thanks to Bergen, the perfect anecdote. Riding in a post-event limousine with Butler, she remarked that the oiled-up Austrian had just exhausted his 15 minutes of fame. Butler disagreed and predicted, Arnold Schwarzenegger is going to be governor of California which actually transpired 25 years later, to which Bergen laughed and retorted, Sure, and Ronald Reagan's going to be President of the United States. 
Grooming Arnold for inevitable stardom and promotion of the film became a focus of the filmmakers. Arnold was definitely our Pygmalion, said Butler. He was so green in those days. He didn't know how to do anything that was socially graceful. Yet he was enormously engaging. Gaines and Butler took Arnold to Andy Warhol's famous factory studio, another stop on the happening tour of America in the 70s. He posed nude for Cosmopolitan magazine, and Gates took him hunting and fishing down at his family home in Alabama. Butler shrewdly held the film's premiere in New York rather than California. Even though California represented the epicenter of both bodybuilding and Hollywood, New York carried the hip celebrity cachet that Butler wanted to be associated with the film. In defining bodybuilding to the public, bodybuilding fans weren't Butler's target market. The goal was to introduce Arnold Schwarzenegger in this still obscure sport to a whole new audience. Rounding up as many celebrities for the evening's event as possible, Arnold went to the premiere of the movie with his mother Aurelia on one arm and the stunning Delfino Ratazzi, an Italian heiress who worked as Jackie or Kennedy's assistant. Among the celebrities in attendance for the bodybuilding premiere, bodybuilders including Robbie Robinson, Ed Corney, Mike Mensah and Mike Katz, as well as others posed for the live audience before many first screenings. Franco did his strongman act blowing up a hot air balloon and bending a steel bar in his teeth. The company that purchased the distribution rights to Pumping Iron hired Ed Corney to help promote the film. He posed 31 times per week for the eight straight weeks that the movie played in the theatre. The Ferrigno family scene featuring Maddie plotting strategy over the dinner table was used as inspiration for that same year's disco hit, Saturday Night Fever starring the little known John Travolta. As a side note, the sequel to Saturday Night Fever, Staying Alive, would go on to be directed by Arnold's other eventual muscular screen nemesis, Sylvester Stallone. Although not captured on film, Louis was famously quoted as saying that all he wanted to do was to play the Hulk character, which was ultimately another off-handed prediction and dream that would eventually come true. Interestingly, beating out Arnold who also auditioned for the part. No one else could have played the Hulk as well as Lou did, and he may have been more publicly visible than Arnold during the late 70s and early 80s. Before playing the Hulk, Lou participated in ABC's Superstar competition, showcasing the athleticism of a large bodybuilder to the public. He and Franco would later participate in 1977's World's Strongest Man competition, airing on national TV and surprising many with a very respectable exhibition of strength for a public that had largely criticised the musculature of bodybuilders to be all show and no go. In fact, many of the bodybuilders of that era not only had interesting lives outside the sport, but they were also respectable athletes in their own rights. Robbie Robinson was a sprinter. Mike Katz and Ken Waller were star college and amateur or professional football players. Franco was a competitive boxer. Even Mike Mensah allegedly could run an 11 second 100 yard dash and he could press 320 pounds overhead, rivaling notable strength athlete of the time, Brian Oldfield. A little known fact is that bodybuilders hated the film on first viewing. Butler recounts, I was anxious to show it to the bodybuilders in the film, so I flew out to California and rented a screening room for the whole Gold's Gym crew to watch it together. I had screened it in New York recently for critics and they had been roaring with laughter at Arnold's jokes, but with the bodybuilders watching, there was a deathly silence. When it was over and the lights came back on, Ken Waller came over to me absolutely livid. He said, you really f***ed it up, George. That was the worst piece of crap I've ever seen. The others seemed to agree with him. Mike Katz, on seeing how he had been portrayed, stormed out of the cinema. But once the bodybuilders saw how well received the film was in the eyes of the public, they warmed to the film and it became the infinitely rewatchable, iconic milestone that it is in the subculture today. 25 years after the release of Pumping Iron, the documentary Raw Iron was released, based on the foregone conclusion that Arnold was entering the field of politics, and he needed to enact some of his own exquisitely timed revisionist history for damage control, to atone for previously politically incorrect sentiments and behaviour. Presenting some new footage and behind the scenes explanations, 
It served primarily to derail the potential political backlash of the things that Arnold had said or did on film, playing up any errant scenes as quote-unquote fictional drama used to sensationalise the film in the eyes of the viewer. Arnold's interview interjections are a calculated mea culpa, strategically aimed at blurring the lines between fact and fiction to the point that now most people believe the entire plot of Pumping Iron to be some kind of contrived creation. However, as Randy Roach in Muscle Smoke and Mirrors notes, Schwarzenegger's problem was that his personal style presented in Pumping Iron mirrored the consistency with his real lifestyle as portrayed in the 1970s media, particularly his interview articles for Wii Magazine, which details recreational drug use and backstage orgies at bodybuilding contests for one. Still, it's a nostalgic delight to see the cast reunited, recount old war stories and fill in some of the blanks behind the subplots and production choices. But when I first watched this 20 years ago, I couldn't help but feel it was a sad reminder of how quickly time passes. The brief and fleeting nature of youth and temporary existence of hard-earned muscle. It's a reminder of how grateful we need to be for this gift of being able to work out and celebrate our ability to create not only our bodies, but our lives in some way.